So, does anyone remember this this one? <laughs> so we're just separating and keeping separating humans from theirs and others, especially they. Shit. So let's have see how do we do that. <clears throat> so we've already talked about this. I just want to remind people what people slip around in is. This is all everything that's not a sewer system quickly. I know I mentioned this on, on day one, but I just want to highlight that again. And so I want to do a quick activity to get you guys all thinking and in the mood for this. And what I want you to do is draw what you think is the sanitation value chain. So basically what what happens what happens to your shit? Okay? Where does shit go? I want you guys to draw that. I want you really to do that. We use in the sector. This is actually the one that's developed by the Gates Foundation, which has your capture, storage, transport, treatment, reuse, and disposal. I think you saw that in, in Captain Duke's presentation. Where you have your, and then the, the second one is developed by a group called Airwag, which uses more the, uh, it's, it's a little more technical and it uses terms like user interface, <laughs> <laughs> and then you have collection and storage, <laughs> conveyance, which is moving the moving the ship usually out of the a pit or something to that effect into to a place where you can store it further or treat it or dispose it or use it. And then you have semi-central centralized treatment and you also have use and or disposal. So some of them are just the same. And I'll just, I just want to highlight the point that, um, okay, um, that came up in our group that I was trying to just explain, and this is a perfect way to do it, was that sometimes the waste gets treated in the pit itself over time, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be collected and taken to a treatment facility. And so this value chain, unlike the other one, sort of kind of helps you capture that you can have collection and storage and go to use and disposal and that can be done in a safe manner. Not easy, not easily, but it can be done. Let's look just quickly at each of the tools. You maybe want to talk for a second about what you're doing on user interface in the MIN and the, the earth auger. Okay, but I would just like to describe what we're trying to do in the MIN and what we're trying to do in the earth auger. Alors, en fogueur, c'est un prototype de, de toilette, un type euh, éco-sang. Bon, quand nous parlons déco il y a les matières fécales qui vont ailleurs et aussi les, les urines qui, qui vont ailleurs. Nous avons identifié quatre ménages pour euh, recevoir et ces, ces prototypes de toilette. Et euh, le, notre objectif, c'est de, de contextualiser. De ce prototype, d'amener ces ménages à les utiliser, à les suivre quotidiennement pour voir un peu euh, euh, leur acceptabilité. Est-ce qu'il y a des choses à corriger Est-ce que ça s'adapte au contexte culturel Parce que euh, les ménages, il y a un grand nombre de personnes euh, qui utilisent ces toilettes. Une dizaine, or, dans d'autres contextes, c'est peut-être deux à trois personnes. Donc nous voulons beaucoup apprendre par rapport à ça. Merci. We were talking already about collection and storage. This is really the pit. This is where, when you flush the toilet, where is it going? And uh, Jen, do you want to talk just for quickly for a second on the dual pit structure we use in, in India, maybe? Which is in India, and this is a uh, required actually nationally by the government, is that each toilet needs to have a dual pit. And so what that means essentially, in the case of our project, is that each of the household toilets, so it's a rural uh, project, so each household that gets a toilet, it has two five-foot deep pits. And the idea is that you put, it has a little T-junction pipe, and you, as you use the toilet, there's a pipe coming from that pan into the ground, into a five-foot deep pit. And you use one pit at a time. And that pit fills up, then you switch your pipe over and you start using the other pit. In the meantime, that other pit, so that five foot deep pit, pit will, can take years to fill with a household. They can use it and what's happening there is that they're actually lined with these concrete rings 
and there's a leaching effect. So some of the liquid is coming out into the ground, and that's perfectly safe to happen, as long as you're not close to a water source right within the vicinity of that. That's a natural thing that's the soil and the bacteria and soil can handle. So when you have one pit full, you stop using that one, you switch over and start using that other pit. In the meantime, there are natural processes that occur that are breaking down some of the harmful pathogens that are in that pit. And so what happens is over the several years that you're using the empty pit, well, as that one fills up, the other pit is actually sanitizing itself, essentially. Now this is the ideal. It's not necessarily what will always happen. Um, different soil conditions and or flooding conditions and that sort of thing sometimes will hinder this process. However, that's the idea. Unfortunately, you, you cannot guarantee that a pit is necessarily safe for the household themselves to empty it, even after it's been sealed up for several years, just because the conditions are variable. We are pretty sure that after about five years or so, that's probably a pretty safe product, and it's essentially compost that you can then apply in, on, on the field. And that's done in a lot of places. Other times you have people come and empty it, empty it for you. But that is essentially the idea. So then that one's safe to empty and use, and you switch over, use that empty fish, the other one sits for a couple of years. And why do it? So that is what the, the product is like in, in India. That's essentially the product. So Kevin, do you want to talk a little bit about the BTO? Sure. The first one that's up there, the human powered emptying and transport. I mean, manual emptying is really disgusting. Like these guys, they take off like pretty much all of their clothes. They get down into these pits with no protective gear. And yeah, we should watch some videos of that. I mean, it's really, really bad. It's, it's, and a lot of countries have, have made it illegal. For that reason, there's a ton of stigma around it. It's usually the lower caste or the poorest of the poor who are doing these jobs, and it's it's really, really bad. Um, the other thing that we found in Abidjan and in, in West Africa as well is often these manual emptiers are you know taking it out of the pit and then just digging another pit, you know, right where a booba car is, and putting the shit into it. So it's not getting the shit very far out of the community. So there are huge, huge challenges around working with manual emptiers. Um, the next is, is motorized emptying and transport. Um, so there's a couple of options that, that we considered in Abidjan. So one is these guys, there are these guys, yeah, mostly guys, no women, um, who are using small motorized um, pumps to empty tanks. But their challenge is they're also not getting it very far out of the community. So they're kind of getting it maybe to the ravine or to the lagoon, but they're still not bringing it um, to the disposal sites. And then there's the vacuum truck operators, and they have some challenges, as John mentioned, often in an urban area. Um, they're not able to um, reach some households that are either difficult to access because of road access or houses being really close together. Um, but when they are able to access the household, they are able to bring the ships as far as, as, as possible, as farther than the other two options um, out of the community to the transfer station. Um, so, yeah. yeah. These semi-central emission <laughs> pieces, these are, these are a little larger scale. They're usually higher technology. You can see that if you've ever seen a sewage treatment plant in a city, you've seen these trickling filters. That's, that's sort of your symbolic looking sewage treatment facility. And the, these are very high, they're usually related to the sewer networks. They're very expensive. Uh, so we're, we're looking at other less sophisticated ways to do neighborhood networks. There's a, there's a technology called a DWAT which dewaters the, the sludge and gets the water out and treats the waste on site. Does do significant DOD level reduction, but not necessarily pathogen reduction. So you still need to eventually take that sludge out of the dewater and get it to a place where it can be properly disposed, treated, or reused. So those are some technologies that are coming up that relate to this. Go ahead, Maybe. Just something to add that 
I found interesting when I first started working on sanitation is that shift is actually very heavy to transport and it costs a lot of money. So dewatering it, so taking some of the liquids out, makes it lighter and makes it more affordable to transport. Yeah, there are some ways, in fact, some of the Gates reinvent the toilet technologies, they, they do incinerate them for, for shift. So that people will try to do that, but it's, that is very energy intensive. So it's not necessarily an affordable option. We're partnering, these are some of our partners that are looking into these types of reuse and our disposal and reuse technologies. They are trying to figure that out. For example, Sandy Sana, they are taking solid waste, garbage, and people's sludge waste, and they're converting it into fertilizer and electricity. And we're thinking about how we might work with them on some, some programs in Ghana, for example. Pivot, they, they have found a way that they dry the sludge and then they convert it into a, a fuel that can be, uh, looks like cat litter, actually. And then you can put it, it's, it's the perfect fuel for a cement. The two issues that you need oxygen and time. But those, those are the things. Uh, eventually, the stuff has to get broken down, actually, erode it, break down, and that takes time. And, and the stuff needs to sit somewhere. So, so if you ever see these stabilization ponds, they're just places to keep shit long enough to get exposure to enough oxygen to break it down so that it becomes safe. Uh, these ideas of treating stuff chemically, I mean, none of that really works. The, the, the point is where do we keep it for long enough and in the right place to accelerate that process so it doesn't take too long and that's the bug gap. You know, that's the that's the nub of this entire issue. Is where do we keep it long enough to get all that oxygen to do its work and all the bacteria that, that, that use the oxygen to break the cell down and move on?